Okay, I think we can start if uh, the other places are also are also okay. So welcome to today's session for the Cross Alps Logic Seminar. It's uh, my pleasure to introduce Damir Jafarov. I met Damir when he was a graduate student, and uh, after that I, I followed his progress. He has been become an expert on especially uh, aspects of computable aspects of combinatorics. So his title today is the, RC, the SRT22 versus Co-Problem. Please, Damir. Okay, thanks so much, Alberto, and and thank you, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. I, I uh, it would be it would be very nice to be there in person in any of these beautiful locations in this seminar. But it's nice to at least see everybody like this, and uh, and uh, so I'm very grateful for the opportunity. And, and indeed, I've known Alberto a long time. He's one of my uh, dear friends and colleagues now, and so it's very nice to nice to speak here. And um, and I I recognize many people from kind of distance, but also there are many who I don't know. So um, Alberto mentioned that this is kind of a mixed audience. There are some experts here, of course, but maybe also some, some uh, uh, people who are, who are closer to starting out. So I hope that uh, I, will, I will try to give kind of a, uh, an, an uneven talk that will ramp up as we go towards the end. So I hope to introduce several different concepts and, uh, and, and make it somewhat accessible, at least at the beginning uh and we'll start with something fun and easy and then we'll then we'll move on to uh to um to more technical aspects as as we progress um i'm not exactly sure how long the talk will be but i i will um i will we will take a break at some point i think uh it was suggested we do that so i think that's a that's a good idea but let's see how it goes and and how 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 we're making progress um okay so the the title here is this srt22 versus co-problem and this is a a uh, you know, it's the, the name is meant to invoke something like P versus NP, right? Something like this. And and of course, it's not that kind of uh, that dramatic a problem, but it's a problem that has played a very central role in this area of reverse mathematics. So I'd like to begin with some background, tell you a little bit about, uh, well, some first some very elementary things, then then tell you a bit about what reverse mathematics is, and then uh, then tell you about this problem towards the end. And uh, a little bit about how it was solved, and also then about uh, what remains of this problem and what what this problem has kind of morphed into, and and what people are thinking about now. Um, okay, so let's start with something very basic. Um, oops, if I can control. Okay, so this will be a, t a talk in three parts. So the first part is going to be called Ramsey's theorem. So I, I I think many people know what this is, but I want to I want to introduce it kind of gently. So let's do something very uh, very elementary here. So let's let n denote the set of natural numbers, 0, 1, 2, et cetera. And then a k coloring for a natural number k, a k coloring of the natural number is just a function that assigns each natural number one of one of k many values, 0 through k minus 1. And you can think of those as colors if you like, right? So if if you know red, green, blue, etc. Um, and we usually use this notation here uh, just to kind of make things brief. So I'll be doing that in this talk. Um, right, uh, so the way to visualize it is here are the natural numbers. Uh, you can see if I highlight like this, it's, it shows up. Yes, we do. Okay, good. Thanks. So if you, if you think of, you know, zero, one, two, et cetera, then, you know, here's a coloring, right? I've, I've assigned each, each number, one of three possible colors. Okay. What does the pigeonhole principle say, or, or the infinitary pigeonhole principle says that if we do this, right, one of these colors has to appear infinitely often. Um, and this is actually a slightly different form that I'm saying here. I'm not saying exactly that, but I'm saying that there's an infinite set on which this coloring is constant, right? It's not quite the same thing, um, but it's, it's, it's of course, equivalent in a, in a strong sense, right? So I'm saying there's an infinite subset of the natural numbers where the coloring is constant. Um, so there it is, right? I mean, you have to, you have to believe me that it, that it continues past the, past the dot, dot, dot. There's, there's infinitely many red dots. Um, Okay, we'll call a set like this, uh, typically one that says monochromatic or, or more commonly homogeneous, at least in the context that I'll be saying here. So this is a homogeneous set. And notice that if, um, if C takes the color I on this homogeneous set, maybe, maybe I is red, right? Then uh, the, the pre-image of the singleton I is, is again an infinite homogeneous set. It might be larger than the H that I had, but 
it's sort of the largest uh, largest homogeneous set that that contains uh, H on which C takes the color I. And there may be many sets, many such sets, right? There need not be just one. There may be there may be many, many. Um, but uh, the pigeonhole principle says there's at least one. Okay. Okay. So this is this is very primitive. Let's 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 take it up a notch. So here's a principle that I will I will rename soon, but for now let's call it the clique principle. I like this this word. So clique means a connected a connected uh, graph, a connected subgraph of a graph. Let's say right. So you have a, a an undirected graph and uh, and uh, and take a connected subgraph. So that's what this will refer to. But let's let's do it properly. So if you give me a set of natural numbers, let's let this bracket a squared as opposed to just a squared. Uh, bracket a squared. This will denote the set of increasing increasing pairs of numbers from from the from from the set a, right? So pairs from the Cartesian product with the first coordinate smaller than the next. And now we again look at k colorings, but this time of these of these increasing pairs, right? So we write such a such a function like this. Yeah, uh, sorry, this should say a here. Sorry about that. Okay, so this is a k coloring of of increasing pairs. And we can again have a notion of homogeneity. A set H subset A is homogeneous for such a coloring if C is constant on just those pairs of numbers that are from H that belong to H. Right? So here it is a bit harder to visualize maybe what this is, but imagine again that we have the natural numbers here, 0, 1, 2, etc. Now what we are doing is we're coloring pairs, right? So we may look at this first number and we need to color this number with all larger all larger numbers, right? So it might look something like this. Right? So this number here is zero is colored red with one and blue with two and so on, right? Green with three. Okay, but we need to we need to do this for the other numbers as well. So now we'll do it for one. We don't have to color this this edge anymore because uh, because of course it's already been colored, but we need to color one with all the larger numbers. Okay, and of course we have to do that for two and for three, right? And so on until we get all the numbers are colored, all pairs of numbers are colored, all increasing pairs. Okay, so it's, it looks like a mess, you know, quite, quite uh, complicated and uh, chaotic in some fashion. But in fact, it's not completely disorderly. <coughs> this, this clique principle, what it says is that if you give me a coloring like this, so something that looks like this, this red, blue, green mess here, then there's an infinite set H so that C is constant on the pairs from H. There's a, there's a homogeneous set for H and an in, infinite such set, right? So if I look at this, this, this picture here, right? A homogeneous set looks something like that. It's a monochromatic clique, right? It's a monochromatic connected subgraph of the, of the graph I had before. Okay, so uh, right, each, each number, not only is it that between any two of these uh, uh, sort of in order they are colored, but but any pair, right? I mean, any any two numbers in this in this graph have a green arrow between them. This is this is this is the, this clique principle, and of course, somehow you can think that this is saying, well, there's no, you cannot have complete chaos in this kind of configuration. There's some nice niceness somewhere. Right? So you can think of this as a higher dimensional analog of the pigeonhole principle, and of course, this is what it is, and we'll we'll generalize it soon enough. But um, you know, going between this slide and this slide, you may you may well suspect that I cheated. You know, that, I mean, this is hard to read, and this maybe I just drew those arrows in there myself. So maybe we should uh, maybe we should prove this principle real quick. And it's you know, it's a very simple proof, but every every talk should have some proof in it. So let's prove something, uh, and uh, also because this is very useful for understanding the problem that I want to talk about today. Okay, so let's say we are given this coloring of pairs, right? This is this is one of these colorings of, of increasing pairs of numbers. What we're going to do is we're going to define a set S, an infinite set S, and the coloring of S, a K coloring of S, not, not of pairs in S, but of singletons in S, right? So this is looking like the clique principle. This is looking like the pigeonhole principle, okay? So we do this, <clears throat> we do this inductively. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to start with S0 being the empty set, and we're going to define an auxiliary set, which is just the complement. It's, it's all natural numbers. Okay, this is the base step. This is the inductive step. There's nothing to define D on. 
for now, this is just the empty set. Now let's let's fix n and let's let's look at the inductive step. So let's say we fixed an infinite set, a finite set, excuse me, S n, and we've already defined D on every number in S n. And let's also assume that we have a set I n, which is in the complement. Um, so let's say that everything in S n is smaller than everything in I n, but I n is infinite. So you can think of this as a kind of reservoir of things we might add to S n, to, to, to our set S. Um, and the other assumption that we'll make is that suppose everything in S n has one and the same color with everything in I n, right? So if you give me something in X, uh, something in S n, some X in S n, and you give me any Y in I n, that color is fixed. It depends only on X. And in fact, it's, it's equal to, it's equal to the color D, right? That, that is, that D assigns it. So D is defined on X. It, it's some color, red, blue, green, and any Y you give me an I n in this reservoir, C of X, Y is equal to that, to that D of X color. This is, this is just our assumption. Surely it's true here. Right. So now what do we do? Well, we take the least number in the reservoir and we add it to, we add it to our SN. But now let's look at this, right? Take the smallest number in, in this reservoir. For one of these colors, by the pigeonhole principle, for one of these colors, since IN is infinite, right? Either zero, one, or all the way up to K minus one, there must be infinitely many numbers Y so that C of X, Y is equal to I. Right? There has to be infinitely many numbers that get used, uh, uh, that, that get assigned the same color. Okay, so fix maybe the least such i, and now what do we do? We set Sn plus 1 to be Sn together with this x. We let In plus 1 be just those y's that have that color with x. Right? And, uh, oh, and I should say, let d of x be i, right? Define d of x to be i. Okay. So what are we doing? We are, we are, kind of thinning out these numbers so that the kind of the reservoir of numbers so that anything we put into S has the same color with respect to the C coloring with everything that's left at every stage, right? So we take something again and we put it in here and we thin out this reservoir so that again, this number has the same color with everything in here. And in the end, we take S to be the union of all these essence and we can apply the pigeonhole principle to the coloring D to get an infinite homogeneous set H. This is the this is the basic this is the proof this is the inductive proof so I think perhaps m many people have seen this argument right if not it's it's quite straightforward but the key to take away here is okay so first of all you know whether I lied on that previous slide or not with the picture uh, it's it's doable it's possible by by this proof but the other the other kind of aspect of this is that it's 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 instructive to look at this proof um, so this, this proof has two main parts, right? If we sort of think about it. there's a kind of pre-processing and a post-processing. What is the pre-processing? Well, first we take we take our C, our coloring C, which is given to, you know, as a is a is a coloring in, in the clique principle. And we pre-process by by obtaining this set S on which C becomes kind of nicer. It, it's more nicely behaved. Right. With respect to this set S, we can think instead of C, a coloring of pairs, we can think of this coloring D, which is a coloring of singletons. A coloring of singletons is easier to work with than a coloring of pairs, right? So you can think of that's a pre-processing step. Then what do we have? Well, now we do a post-processing where we take this set S and this coloring D and we find an infinite homogeneous set for this set D and that is a homogeneous set for C. So it's kind of these two steps, right? First, a thinning or pre-processing step, and then applying a simpler principle uh, to this coloring D and S to, 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 to get the, the, the homogeneous that we want. So two steps. And what's interesting is there are many proofs of, of this clique principle that I just gave. There's inductive proofs, ultra filter proofs, compactness proofs, and all of them feature some kind of split along these in broad, in broad outline into these kind of two halves. The title of this of my talk, the SRT22 versus co problem, refers in some sense to a, a kind of combinatorial distillation of these two of these two halves, right? So as a I'm not going to talk about the problem yet for a little while, but Looking ahead, you can think, well, what's what's this all about, really? It's understanding the relationship between these two parts of the proof, this pre-process and this post-process. Right? So I'll, I'll, I'll come back to it um, uh, in a little bit. Well, uh, in, in the sort of the second half of the talk.
Okay, so um, let's let's call things by by their proper name rights, right? So both both the pigeonhole principle and, and this clique principle that I called it are, of course, uh, special cases of this so-called Ramsey's theorem, which is a, a, a fundamental result in combinatorics and, and, and of course also logic. And in fact, Ramsey uh, Ramsey proved it with you know no interest in combinatorics really. He was trying to he was trying to he was thinking about the Entscheidungsproblem and and uh, you know and, and 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 logic, and he was trying to. Uh, uh, so he was very much motivated by by logical aspects. So it's perhaps not surprising that even though this is on its face a, a combinatorial principle, it has so there's so much interest in it in, in logic, and and indeed that's that that will be the case here as well. So Ramsey's theorem is just the generalization of everything we've been talking about. So. Here again, let this square bracket to the end just denote the set now not of increasing pairs, but increasing n tuples of elements with of a. A k coloring of a to the n is just what you would expect. It gives one of k many colors to each increase. Sorry, this should again be a. It's copy paste for you. So now you you assign each each increasing n tuple of elements of a one of k many colors, and a set h is homogeneous if if the same thing, right? Uh, c is constant on the increasing n tuples from h. Ramsey's theorem says, if you give me any n and any k and any coloring, any k coloring of the of the increasing n tuples of natural numbers, there's an infinite homogeneous set uh, for that coloring, an infinite subset h, such that c is constant on the increasing n tuples from h. Okay, so the pigeonhole principle is really Ramsey's theorem restricted to n equal one, the clique, the clique principle from the previous slides is Ramsey's theorem for n equal two. Um, we're going to use this ac this abbreviation here, R T N K. This is this is the this is what we use in logic, uh, in computability theory. Excuse me, in in combinatorics, I think there are, are there are different abbreviations, but in, in in computability theory, we use this. So R T N K is the restriction of Ramsey's theorem to colorings of n tuples and k. Uh, k many colors. Okay, so that's what that's what R T M K will be, and usually we'll just take k equal two. Just when you have two colors to a, to a large extent, you can ex you can understand Ramsey's theorem for any number of colors, and I'll talk about that uh, a bit later on as well. Okay, so this is the kind of first part, just making sure we're all on the same page as far as Ramsey's theorem, because it will be such a a, a critical component of this of this talk. If there are any questions. Um, Please, uh, I, I think, please just interrupt me because it's hard to monitor for any kind of hand signals or anything like that as I'm looking at the slides. So please feel free to, to ask uh, at any point. Okay. So let's um, let's skip to the second part of the talk now or move to it. And that's that's reverse mathematics. Um, and, and I'll be mentioning kind of reverse mathematics in, in connection with computability, right? So I'm going to assume uh, I'm going to give a, some background on reverse mathematics, assuming just some basic logic, um, and I'll also assume that at least people have an intuitive concept of of what computability should be. But I'll say what I mean by it in in just a, in just a minute. Right? But let's let's just focus on on reverse mathematics for now. Um, so this is a this is a very broad and active program um, in mathematical logic, and it's and it's sort of motivated by a foundational question. Which is, you know, it's this ancient question that Euclid and uh, ancient Greek geometers were asking about thousands of years ago, which is, you know, if you want to prove a theorem, which axioms do you actually need, right? I mean, do you need the parallel postulate to prove the, you know, whatever the adjacent angle theorem or whatever you have, right? The, the Greeks were already asking about this, and and of course, in modern mathematics and modern logic, this is this is still a central question. Reverse mathematics is somehow an attempt to do this in a systematic fashion um, and with respect to uh, not maybe particular theorems, but to give a framework in which uh, we could do this for all theorems, right? for, for, for all theorems of, let's say, ordinary mathematics. So if you ask this question, right, you naturally have this, um, you, the, the answer naturally leads you to the concept of the strength of a theorem. So if you need stronger axioms to, to prove a theorem, not just are, that these axioms are sufficient to prove the theorem, but you need them, um, they are necessary, then you might say, well, then, then the theorem is somehow strong, right? If it's provable in very weak system, if it, with very weak axioms, you might think it's a weak theorem, right? Or if two theorems require exactly the same axioms, you might say they are kind of equivalent in strength. 
So the most famous example of this is, is the axiom of choice, right? So if you look at something like Sir Mello Frankel's set theory, ZF, then of course it's 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 very famous result that the axiom of choice is equivalent to Zorn's lemma, even though these have very different motivations, very different origins, but they are equivalent, right? So you cannot have one without the other. Um, and that's nice and that's useful for this particular example, but if you're interested in kind of day-to-day uh, theorems of mathematics, not in set theory, not in category theory, not in anything somehow mathematically exotic, right? If you think of mathematics that has existed for 200 years or more, then this is really too strong. And of course, it's it's too strong by design, right? ZF and, 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 and more broadly ZFC with choice is meant to prove everything, right? That's the whole motivation behind it. We want to have a solid axiomatic system for all of mathematics. So everything should be provable in it. So it's hard to say which theorems are equivalent to which others if they are all provable in this system. So we want something different. We would like a different axiomatic uh, framework. We would like results in general um, of the form, you know, given some theory T, some logical theory T, theorem P implies or is equivalent to a theorem Q. And we would like conditions on T that it be, you know, weak enough, unlike ZF or ZFC, that it doesn't prove everything we care about already. Things are kind of trivially equivalent in that case, right? But it should, it should be, it should have some strength, right? It should allow some kind of basic coding, some kind of basic combinatorial representations and so on, so that we can just get off the ground and, and do something, right? If you take no axioms, you will certainly satisfy this first uh, requirement, but uh, you won't be able to do anything with it, right? So you want some kind of sweet spot, not too strong, not too not too weak. Okay. So ZF ZF is not that, but um, one framework which which does lend itself very nicely to this is is, is um, second order arithmetic and its and its subsystems. So uh, second order arithmetic uh, is a it's a first order theory, like piano arithmetic, except it has two sorts of variables. It has variables for numbers, like, like maybe you've seen in piano arithmetic or um, simple arithmetical systems like this, Robinson's arithmetic, the same language. But it also has a second sort of variables which are intended to uh, denote uh, sets of numbers, right? So you can talk about numbers and sets of numbers, and there's a, there, you have the epsilon relation which connects the set membership. Okay, so this is, this is, this is called, uh, um, well, the language of this is called L2 and Z2 then is piano arithmetic together with uh, just kind of this unrestricted comprehension axiom saying, if you give me a formula phi uh, in this language, then the set of quote unquote, the set of numbers satisfying phi exists, right? That exists as a set. Um, and the, the way one works with this in, in the context of reverse mathematics is, is by restricting which formulas phi one looks at and thereby obtaining subsystems of of second order arithmetic. So uh, the most common ones are, uh, are these ones here. So RCA naught, which restricts phi to uh, delta zero one form. Delta zero one is not a class of formulas, but formulas which are equivalent, uh, have both an equi uh, a sigma zero one, so one existential quantifier, or pi zero one, one universal quantifier formulation. So they, are, they, they can be written as, as one or the other. Um, if you know Post's theorem from computability, then this is this is basically saying you can define things computably, and I'll I'll talk more about that connection in a minute. Um, there's another famous uh, uh, subsystem called WKL naught. This stands for weak Koenig's lemma, and this says uh, this essentially it's not quite of this form, but it essentially kind of restricts these formulas to saying well. Uh, things you can get through by looking at paths through infinite binary trees. So if you think of a, a tree and it's binary, each node is labeled zero or one and, and, it's, and it's infinite and has infinite height, then you can, by Koenig's lemma, you can take a path. And uh, what kinds of sets of numbers you can get from these paths is what WKL not allows you to prove. ACA not now just says uh, which sets exist, those definable by arithmetical formula. So this phi can have any number of alternating uh, quantifiers you like. ATR not allows you to um, um, iterate arithmetical formulas around along countable well orders, and then if you if you look beyond that, you're now looking at um, uh, uh, 
analytic hierarchy, you're looking at uh, uh, pi one one sigma one one formula. So now you can have uh, quantifiers ranging over sets as well. And 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 of course it continues beyond that. But these are the these are the principal systems, five systems. And this RCA naught here, um, this stand, I should say this stands for recursive comprehension axiom. I said this stands for weak Koenig's lemma. This here is arithmetical comprehension axiom. This is arithmetical transfinite rec recursion. This is just comprehension axiom. So these five systems are somehow the, the core systems that, that one works in with reverse mathematics with RCA naught serving as a, as a base theory. This is this theory T that we really wanted in the, in the previous slide. Um, so here is, here is how they line up. You have RCA not all the way at the bottom. It's it's a it's a relatively weak system. It's it's quite close to um, a kind of constructive mathematics. Um, it is you know it's not quite constructive, but it's 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 computable mathematics with a kind of strong constructive aspect. Above that, you have WKL not ACA not ATR not pi one one CA not. You can you can go all the way through kind of different levels of the of the set quantifiers. Somewhere above that, and this arrow here should be quite a bit longer, you have full second order arithmetic, and then this arrow here should be much, much, much longer, uh, and then you get ZFC, right? So um, these are weak systems, and in particular, because everything has to be a number or a set of numbers, think the only kinds of things you can express here are, are things that are countable or somehow um, countably represented or countably based, but I'll, 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 I'll talk more about that in a, in a minute. But it is a it is a robust system for 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 stating many many theorems of mathematics. Um, let me say something a little about the connections with computability theory. So um, so here's just a a, a very brief um, you know one sentence definition. The, the the kind of the principal theme of computability theory in mathematical logic as opposed to in in computer science is this idea of relative computability of one set being computable from another. So a set A is computable from B or Turing reducible to B, which is where we get this, this subscript T, A is Turing below B, if there's some effective procedure phi so that A is equal to phi of B. What that means is if I, if I know which numbers are and are not in B, so A and B I should say are, you know, to be absolutely clear, are subsets of the natural numbers. If I have the information about which numbers are in B and which numbers are not in B, then I can plug that information into a computer and it, the computer can tell me which numbers are in A and which are not in A. Like this, is the, this is relative computability. And what kind of computer, uh, any computer you want, uh, like your, you know, whatever computer you're watching this talk on, but um, just, you know, allow it to have uh, unbounded amounts of energy and RAM and all this, right? So I, I don't care about these kinds of practical considerations at all. It has to run in finite time. It has to write, you know, uh, finite resources, but it can, it, can, it can outlast the universe if it wants. I have no restrictions on this. This is, this is Turing computability, right? Um, so a famous example of a set that's not computable in this set is the, is the halting problem or the halting set, right? So if you have a set A, and you have, then you can form this, this set A jump or A prime. And this says, you know, in some effective enumeration of all computer programs, A jump is those I, uh, those indices I, such that the ith program in this enumeration with access to information from A uh, halts in finite time. So the, the program actually executes, doesn't, doesn't give you an infinite, you know, infinite loop forever. Um, and it's known that in general for every set A, right, A is strictly below A, uh, A prime. Okay, so where is, why is this interesting with respect to what we're talking about? Well, in reverse mathematics, there is a strong connection between computability and, and, and these subsystems of second order arithmetic, which is that um, if you look at standard models of, of, of these subsystems, of course, these are, these are extensions of, uh, or sort of fragments, extensions of fragments of piano arithmetic. Um, they can have non-standard models, right? They, the, the natural numbers can be non-standard in these models, uh, just as they can in piano arithmetic. Um, but if, if, if you look at just those models where the universe is standard, so the natural numbers look like they normally do, then, um, then the models of these various subsystems all correspond to various kinds of natural closure points uh, with respect to computability theory. 
Um, so if, if, uh, if we're looking at these standard models, typically we call those omega models, just to emphasize that the, the universe is omega, it's the natural numbers with the, with the order type omega. So for example, if we look at that base system RCA0, we can characterize the omega models as exactly those collections of sets that are closed under Turing reducibility. So if something is in my model, anything computable from it is, is in the model. And uh, this join operation, which just says if you have two sets, their kind of disjoint union is also in, in, in the model. Um, so for example, the set of computable sets, the collection of computable sets is an omega model of RCA0. That's a very basic, very basic model. AC0 uh, is, is the omega models of AC0 are characterized by being uh, closed under the jump operator. So if I have a set A in my model, I also necessarily have a jump, a prime, the, the whole thing. Set. And therefore I have a prime prime, double prime, right? And so on. So whereas the models of RCA0 you can think are kind of closed downwards, the models of ACA0 are kind of strongly pushing you to close upwards, right? So they have very different behaviors. The models of ACA0 you can think are quite large. The models of RCA0 can be quite small. Um, and in general, right, there is, uh, this allows for a very nice correspondence between what's known as computable mathematics and reverse mathematics, um, which is that the, the strength of a theorem in terms of the subsystems of second order arithmetic that we've been looking at can often be gauged just by looking at the effectivity of kind of solving that, that, that theorem solving instances of that problem, right? So if you think of a problem as uh, a mathematical theorem as corresponding to a problem, some kind of mathematical problem, then you can think that problem has instances and that problem has solutions. Uh, each of those instances has solutions and I'll talk about this more in a little bit. And now you might ask, well, how effective are the, instant, uh, are the solutions to a given instance, right? So let's think about an example here. Here's a mathematical theorem, every commutative unit ring, is that a question? No, oh, sorry, I thought I heard. Right, so here's the theorem of algebra. Every commutative ring has a maximal ideal. So you can think of that as a problem, given a commutative ring, find a maximal ideal. What are the instances of this problem? Well, an instance is a commutative ring, right? Somebody gives you a commutative ring. What are the solutions to, to that instance? They're the maximal ideals. So there, there could be one solution, there could be many solutions to a given instance. But now you can ask natural questions, right? If you give me a computable commutative ring, does there always exist a computable maximal ideal? Or is there a commutative ring which is computable, so it's kind of simple computability theoretically, but maybe all the ideals compute zero prime. So they are, you know, it has a simple instance with very complicated solutions. This, there is this kind of nice back and forth between this, these kinds of problems and, uh, and the things one does in reverse mathematics. Okay, so um, let's look at some, some examples of that. Um, these are some, you know, just to give a couple, a small survey, right, of, of just classical results from, uh, uh oh, I have, sorry, something happened. Okay. Um, uh, so the, I will distinguish between sort of classical reverse mathematics and then reverse mathematics in a more modern sense that I'll that I'll talk about later. But here are some some examples. So um, um, it's it's an interesting fact that if you look at miniaturizations to accountable setting of um, of the um, um, of, of mathematical theorems, um, uh, then all of these are. A vast majority of these can be expressed in uh, can be expressed in the language of second order arithmetic, and in fact, sort of accommodated in this framework. They can be proved in Z two. So the, the vast majority of theorems of ordinary mathematics, when miniaturized into a countable setting. So instead of saying every ring, say every countable ring. Instead of saying every metric space, say every separable metric space. Right. So that you have some kind of countable basis for everything you're talking about. So if you do this kind of maneuver then any such theorem, vast majority of theorems like this can be proved in Z2. And what's even more interesting is that um, uh, the vast majority of those theorems are either provable in RCA0, the base theory, the, the simple kind of fragment that we're looking at, or equivalent over that base theory, over RCA0, to one of the other, other subsystems, right? 
So here's here are some examples. Um, uh, so these are theorems provable in RCA not in the base theory, the bare category theorem, intermediate value theorem, Ursan's lemma, existence of algebraic closures of countable fields, right? And of course, we should interpret all of these things with having you know intermediate value theorem applying to some kind of countable representations of continuous functions uh, um, on on in, in R uh, and so on, right? Um, here are some results that are equivalent to WKL, the next system up. This one often corresponds to various kinds of compactness results. So heine borel theorem for uh, the closed unit interval, Brouwer fixed point theorem, and the result that every commutative ring has a prime ideal. So I'll mention, I'll, I'll come back to this in a second. But all of these theorems can be proved by some kind of compactness-like argument, right? Which is not to say that they all have the same proof, but I think in, mathematicians frequently express this idea, oh, you know, it's a, it's a compactness proof, it's a compactness proof. And they may mean very different things, but there's a germ of something similar to, to that. And, and in a certain sense, you can think of that as being captured by, by WKL naught here, right? So all of these are equivalent to WKL naught over RCA naught. So WKL naught proves each of these theorems and RCA naught proves that each of these theorems implies WKL naught, right? So, so if you want to believe in the heine borel theorem, you have to believe in WKL naught. That's the, that's the right way to think of it. In the same way that if you want to believe in Zorn's lemma, you have to believe in the axiom of choice, so long as you assume also ZF. Um, okay. Here are some examples equivalent to ACA naught. So this is the next stronger system, and it's, it's, a, it's a very strong theorem. We have the boson of Arstrass theorem. Every countable vector space over the rationals has a basis, and every commutative, uh, commutative ring has a maximal ideal. And again, this, you know, this countable commutative ring has a maximal ideal. So this is interesting, right, because um, this is telling you that the, 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 the proof that um, or the existence of a prime ideal is, is, is weaker than the existence of a maximal ideal, which is not something that one normally notices in, in an algebra course, because how do you normally prove that there's a maximal ideal? You apply Zorn's lemma and you're done. How do you prove there's a prime ideal? You just, you just notice that every maximal ideal is prime, so you're, you're done, right? But here, not only is there a more effective proof that doesn't require you to use choice, but in fact, these two proofs have, have different strengths, right? Which is quite, quite striking, I think, and a nice illustration of the kind of, um, the kind of thing reverse mathematics is good at, is good at doing. Um, here are some theorems equivalent to ATR naught, comparability of well orderings, open clope and determinacy. And then, you know, as you go on up, there are, there are more and more complicated theorems that are more and more kind of uh, esoteric or they become set theoretic and then you're moving into descriptive set theory and so on. So it's, uh, things get more complicated as, as you move on. But what this is illustrating is, is this thing that I'm, that, that, that's often called the big five phenomenon, right? Um, so this is that big five phenomenon that if you look at the vast majority of theorems of mathematics miniaturized, again, either they are provable in RCA not or they are equivalent to one of these other or systems, right? So this is just a little slide from a, a paper by Steve Simpson, who was one of the main developers and, and promulgators of, of reverse mathematics. The subject as a whole kind of started with work of, of Harvey Friedman, um, but then was, was really developed by, by Simpson and, and his students, including Alberto. Um, and uh, um, this is kind of illustrating, right, that in all these different areas, there are theorems that are, you know, so here's, there is a theorem of differential equations that's equivalent as provable in RC naught and equivalent to WKL naught. There is a theorem concerning continuous functions. You know, there are two theorems provable in RC naught, two theorems equivalent to WKL naught, one provable in RCA. This is a slide many years old, but it's kind of showing you some kind of distribution of theorems, right? I mean, I should say that this is really quite outdated by modern standards. I mean, there are hundreds of theorems that have been looked at by this point, but it's, but it's illustrating this big five phenomenon, right? That really, there's something going on. It's an empirical fact that it's going on. I don't think anybody kind of uh, anticipated when the, the pro pro project was getting started that this would happen, but um, it is nonetheless uh, true and it's quite interesting. And I think there are philosophical implications here that, you know, for, for people who are interested in that can be drawn. And certainly people are working on that, people like Benedict Eastaw and others we're trying to understand why, why is mathematics structured in this way that this is happening, right? Um, but this is not, not my area and I'm, I'm fascinated by it, but I, I don't have anything uh, interesting to say on it. Um, but, uh, um, 
of course, once you see some kind of regularity happening in, in mathematics, um, the interesting question is, you know, what are, what are the exceptions, right? And uh, uh, that's, that's, that becomes the, the focus. And similarly here, um, and this, the reason this is interesting and the reason the, um, you know, I, I spent a while talking about Ramsey's theorem is because the exceptions largely come from Rams, looking at Ramsey's theorem and, and trying to understand Ramsey's theorem. Uh, oops. So, um, so let's look at this question, right? Where does, where does Ramsey's theorem fit in? Um, so uh, the, the earliest result, you know, sort of that, that can be understood as saying something, you know, answering this question in some sense is due to Specker long before reverse mathematics existed, but doing kind of a computable analysis of Ramsey's theorem, which, um, which, uh, um, can be translated to the parlance of reverse mathematics to tell us that the base theory RCA not proves Ramsey's theorem for exponent n. So remember, this is for increasing n tuples, right? Ramsey's theorem for increasing n tuples for fixed n, if and only if n is equal to one. So if if we sort of look at the pigeonhole principle of partitioning the natural numbers into two parts, which then asserts at least one of those parts is infinite, then RCA not our base theory can prove that as one would hope. Um, but uh, if n is bigger than one, then, then RCA naught cannot. And Jock has showed then, you know, that this was kind of a very early result. I believe this was in the 60s, maybe. Jock is in a, in a seminal paper in 1972, really took up this work and said, well, what, what else can we say about Ramsey's theorem in the context of, again, he was looking at the context of computability theory, but the results transfer to, to this more kind of convenient parlance. And what he showed was the following. So if n is at least three, so if we're looking at least at colorings of triples, order triples, then in fact, RTN2 is equivalent to ACA0 over RCA0. So it's the third strongest system. Um, but he also showed that WKL0, um, WKL0 does not prove Ramsey's theorem for pairs, right? So ACA0, uh, sorry, uh, this is not what I meant to say. Uh, yes, this is right. So WKL0, sorry, that is right. WKL not does not prove Ramsey's theorem, right? So ACA not proves Ramsey's theorem for all exponents, uh, all, all n, but um, WKL not does not prove Ramsey's theorem for pairs. And he left open um, the question of whether, in fact, um, Ramsey's theorem for pairs is also equivalent to ACA not, right? This was something he, he didn't know in his paper, and, and his coding technique for giving this equivalence did not work for pairs. You really needed three degrees of freedom. Uh, to do it. Um, and this was open for 20 years until uh, Cedipin, David Cedipin, as a, a graduate student, solved, solved that question um, by showing remarkably that Ramsey's theorem for pairs does not imply ACN. Right? So um, Jockish and, you know, was a senior uh, leader in the field and, and left this question open. And this graduate student uh, came along and solved, solved it and, and, in fact, got this very surprising result that that Ramsey's theorem does not imply ACA not. Um, so it's different. It's it's different than Ramsey's theorem for triples and, and four tuples and so forth. That's one interesting thing. Um, Jockish also left open the question of whether the, 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 the reverse implication here, does Ramsey's theorem imply WK or not? And this was open not for 20 years, but for, for 40 years. Uh, this was 2011, 13, that uh, uh, it was solved. Again, in the negative, um, and this time by an undergraduate student. So that's a, that's a really remarkable story, right? So this Jailu is not no longer an undergraduate student, but at the time he was. He's a you know established senior researcher now. But at the time when he solved this, he was an undergraduate student, and and lots of people had worked on this question. Lots of people had tried to solve it, and uh, failed. And he he solved it uh, using a brilliant, clever uh, combinatorial argument. Um, uh, just, you know, it's a remarkable fact that I think, it's, you know, one of those kind of just, uh, really striking stories in, in, in math. So, um, so Ramsey's theorem does not even imply WKL not, right? Which in particular, this is a stronger statement than this one, since WKL not is weaker than ACA not. Okay. So Ramsey's theorem for pairs, if we look at any two, n equal two, right? Defies the big five phenomenon. This phenomenon of everything either being provable in RCA not or equivalent to one of the other systems is uh, does not hold for Ramsey's theorem for pairs. It holds for the other exponents, 
but not for pairs. So why, right? Why is this the case? What is special about Ramsey's theorem? Why does it behave so differently from other mathematical theorems? This is a huge question, and in large part, it's motivating research in this field still, uh, and, and uh, in fact, has kind of given rise to this massive industry of research in, in reverse mathematics and computable combinatorics. So here's the, here's the picture, right? This is, this is what we saw before. The, these are the kind of the main five uh, subsystems of second order arithmetic. Here's Ramsey's theorem for triples showing this nice regular behavior, right? Like other theorems, bolzano warstrass theorem, all these, all these theorems of ordinary mathematics. But here's Ramsey's theorem for pairs off to the side, right? It's off to the, it's, it's, it's very much off to the side, um, not equivalent. Okay. Um, so uh, in an attempt to understand this question, um, <clears throat> uh, um, people have looked at all kinds of other combinatorial principles. And it is interesting that um, largely all of these things came from combinatorics. But, um, you know, uh, this is a, a small slide of various things folks have looked at, um, you know, uh, various kind of aspects of the computable content of Ramsey's theorem for pairs, weaker, stronger versions, and of course, variations of various types. Um, there has been work on principles about partial and linear orders, so Dilworth's theorem, which is a consequence of Ramsey's theorem, tree theorem, so there's kind of a, Millikan's tree theorem, which is a strong form of Ramsey's theorem, but also weaker forms of tree theorems. There's tournament principles, so-called Erdős-Moser theorem. Again, this is a consequence of Ramsey's theorem. Um, uh, common, various combinatorial principles arising from notions of algorithmic randomness. Heinemann's theorem, of course, is a, is a huge one that's where there are still many, many questions open. Um, so there's a, a spectacular amount of work that people have looked at, just you know, flipping through a combinatorics book and seeing what, what connects to Ramsey's theorem can we get somehow at the, the, the strength, at understanding better the strength of Ramsey's theorem by understanding some of these ancillary principles, some of these things surrounding it, right? In combinatorics, there is a, there is a kind of um, constellation of principles that people look at, all of these things here and, and many more, right? And um, even though they are not looking at formal systems in any real sense, they are looking at ways of understanding these things uh, through um, growth rates of, of uh, provably total functions or, or size estimates on sizes of solutions when you're looking at finite versions or something like this. And they are comparing strengths in a different way and getting kind of some kind of relationships between them. Here we're looking just in terms of provability over RC0. Um, and all of these theorems are somehow connected to Ramsey's theorem if one looks at provability over RC0. Most of the vast majority of them are consequences of Ramsey's. They, they are implied by Ramsey's theorem. And more importantly, and maybe more interestingly, they all, or by and large, they, they, they all uh, defy the big five as well. And so we, you know, we started with a very nice linear picture of these systems and then Ramsey's theorem coming off to the side. And then over 20, 30 years, people have been looking at all kinds of variations on it to the point where the picture, you know, this is not a complete picture, but it looks more like this, right? So um, very far from linear. Uh, and in fact, you know, it's uh, quite complicated to the point where it's now, this is called the reverse mathematics zoo, right? So Ramsey's theorem, at least in one guise, is, is right here where my cursor is. Um, and in fact, you know, all of these, this kind of this wealth of things lies below it, right? So it's, it, it has a special privileged position here in that it's actually quite strong with respect to these systems, uh, these other principles. But um, uh, uh, there are many things, many things going on here. Right? Um, here's, I don't know, RC not down here. So this is the, the base theory. Okay, I mean, nobody's meant to be able to read this slide. It's just kind of for shock value, right? But also to illustrate that there is, there is some kind of, there is something going on here. And in some sense, maybe this is a more interesting confirmation of the fact that reverse mathematics works. Right, because if, if we have the big five phenomenon, it still would point to the fact maybe that reverse mathematics is a bit limiting. Um, ZF has the big one phenomenon, or ZFC has the big one phenomenon, right? Everything is provable in it. Um, and that doesn't make it a very interesting tool to study the relative strength of, of theorems of ordinary mathematics. 
somehow the big five phenomenon would say it's also two cores. But this is saying that at least for things that are combinatorial or somehow combinatorially related, um, it's actually quite a fine tool. Um, and that's, so that's the, that's the kind of goal to understand uh, 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 these different principles using the fine tools offered by reverse mathematics. And in fact, in this next uh, part of the talk, what I wanna talk about is finer reducibility still, uh, ways to really get at uh, some of the finer distinctions between these principles. So I hope, you know, maybe there are some who have not seen the reverse mathematics, hopefully that was useful. Um, now I wanna talk about um, uh, finer reducibilities. And again, uh, you know, I'll, 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 I'll kind of cycle back to Ramsey's theorem as a, as a point of, as a common point of, uh, of, any, of kind of an, a common example. Um, and then in the last part, we'll, we'll start talking, we'll talk about this, uh, this actual problem that is the title of the talk, right? Um, so the, the finer reducibilities are, are more modern, uh, more recent uh, <clears throat> addition to this kind of project or program of reverse mathematics. And I, I think of reverse mathematics now as, as including these finer reducibilities, so that it's not just about subsystems of second order arithmetic anymore, as, as originally conceived by, by Friedman and Simpson, but really kind of this, this focus on comparing problems, whether it be over subsystems of arithmetic or in this in this finer way that I that I want to discuss now. Whoops. Uh, okay. So um, so let's suppose we have um, problems P and Q. And again, I want to think of these as these kind of instant solution problems. So problem P. Uh, is an instance solution problem. The problem in this sense, again, if it has a set of instances, and for each instance, a, a set of solutions, which may be many different solutions, right? Um, there's a natural way to translate many theorems into problems like this, as, as we've discussed, as we've seen in the example. But um, now let's talk about how one might reduce one kind of problem to another. And one way to do this is, is via this notion of computable reducibility. So P is computably reducible to Q, and we'll write P is C below Q if, if the following is true. So maybe it's just better to look at this picture. Um, you give me an instance X of P and from it, we can compute an instance X hat of Q of the other problem. And now no matter what solution, any solution you give me, Y hat to X hat in the Q problem, from it, I can compute a solution Y to the original problem. And here I have X computes because it's computes together with X. It might be that I need to consult the original instance for something as I'm, as I'm computing this to get, to get the solution, right? But this is a very natural kind of shape of a reduction, right? It's essentially a way to say, I can effectively transform the, the task of solving problem P to the task of solving problem Q. Each instance computes an instance, each solution computes a solution, right? So there are many guises of this. If, if you know, in, 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 in computer science, one looks at um, polynomial time reductions between, you know, some, I don't know, SAT problems and, and, and finite, uh, I don't know, graph colorability or something like this. It's, a, it's the exact same shape of a reduction. And um, uh, here, this is, a, this is a particularly common way of saying one problem is reducible to another. It was sort of first, first, uh, um, Kind of isolated in 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 these papers, but but it really is is something that's been implicit in in work in computable combinatorics since since the beginning, um, so decades. Um, so it's 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 a uh, um, a particularly nice way of reducing one problem to another. Um, I'll say that uh, you know just for completeness, it's possible to have this a strong version of this, where each instance of P computes an instance of Q. And each solution to that instance on the Q side computes a solution to the original instance on the P side without referencing that original instance. And that we call that strongly computable reducibility. And there are models of computation where maybe this, this makes sense, you know, where you read some data and in the process of reading that data, it gets destroyed so it can't be used again. So maybe there's some interest in that, but in this context, in this, in this setting, it just means that these these two problems P and Q are somehow even more closely together, uh, even closer together than than just under computable reducibility, right? Um, often in many reductions between problems, uh, this backward reduction might just even be the equality, the identity, 
right? So you, you take an instance X of P, you compute an instance X hat of Q, and then every solution to that on the Q side just is a solution to X on the P side. This is a, not, a very common shape of reduction uh, as well, right? In that case, that would be one of these strong, strong computable reducibilities. Um, there's another <laughs> variant, another reduction, which is actually um, has been studied for longer, at, you know, as as a reduction, and that's um, Virach reducibility. So um, this is due to 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 Virach and is sort of developed in the in the 80s and 90s in, in computable analysis, and then really um, kind of um, uh, promulgated and, and developed by Vasco Bratka and and, and many others. Um, but it was in this paper of, of, of Gerardi and, 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 and Marcona and Alberto that it was kind of noticed that actually this is, you know, this should somehow relate to reverse mathematics. And, um, and then independently sometime later in, in a paper of, by Francois Duray, myself, Jeff Hurst, Joe Maletti and Paul Schaefer, we rediscovered this notion and um, kind of just out of ignorance, didn't know about, about the work of Bayrach or, 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 or Alberto and, 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 and Already, because uh, it was already noted that this is a nice refinement, we were presenting it as something brand new, but it really wasn't. So this is this is a uniform version of what we saw in the previous slide. So P is Virac reducible to Q, if the same exact situation as before, but now now the reduction is uniform. So that means that you give me an instance X of 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 P, and there's a an effective procedure that turns that into an instance X hat of Q. But that effective procedure cannot depend on X. It has to be the same effective procedure no matter what X is, right? So, for example, the effective procedure might be something like take every other bit, right? If we think of X as a, as a sequence of bits, zeros and ones, then we may say the effective procedure might be take every other bit. That does not depend on X. That will be the same no matter what X you feed it. It's one fixed uniform procedure, right? Similarly, then, oops. Uh, the procedure in the back direction has to be uniform, right? So if you give me any solution y hat to x hat on the q side, it uniformly computes together with x a solution y to x on the p side. Okay, so this it's a it's a uniform procedure, and you can really think of this then as as a kind of function, right? Uh, the function takes in an input x, it outputs x hat, uh, an, a, a, an instance of q, and then as a as an Takes an input y hat and outputs, uh, and outputs this kind of uh, uh, solution y to x, right? So it's really a, a machine, one single machine that's doing this. And in computable analysis, this is this is the kind of view that the the subject had in in, in its kind of uh, the, the view that subject takes. And uh, so it's a natural view to, to look there, a natural kind of reducibility to look at there. Um, but uh, it's interesting to compare it, right? Just as it, just as between computable and strong computable reducibility, one can now look at Virac reducibility, computable reducibility, and so on, and see in what sense does this problem P really reduce to Q, right? Um, so again, it was noted maybe for the first time in this paper by 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 Gerardi and Marcona that that this is some kind of way of comparing problems that that should be um compared to or at least thought of uh alongside uh um uh, reverse mathematics the, the project of reverse mathematics and the reason for that is is this so um um let's say we have p and q which are problems then we have this nice diagram that oh uh p is you know if we look at the kind of strong version in the same way that we have strong computable reducibility of virac reducibility and strong Virach implies strong computable implies Virach. Both of those imply computable reducibility. So if P is Virach reducible to Q, P is uniformly computably reducible to Q, then of course it's computably reducible to Q. And this one here implies that Q is what's known as computably entails P. Oh, I'm so sorry, this should say P below Q. I'm, I'm sorry for that typo. What, it's, what it means is that if you look at an omega model of Q, Right, omega model in the sense of subsystems of second order arithmetic. So it's a model of one of these, uh, a model of second order arithmetic in which the, the universe is standard. It's it's actually the natural numbers. Then every model of Q is a model of P. So if we if if we like if you like then what you what you can what you 
the kind of moral of this is that if you're reducible, if P is reducible to Q in any of the senses on these in these slides, then RCA naught proves that Q implies P. That's the, the 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 thing we would like to say. It doesn't because there might be some non there might be some issues related to induction, which means that yes, this is true in every standard model, but maybe not in some non-standard model. And actually, I'll talk about an example of this in a minute. Um, but so long as you're not too bothered by induction issues or non-standard issues, or maybe you just believe in the natural numbers as they as they really are, then you know. On that view, every one of these reductions implies provability over RC now, right? So these are refinements um, modulo these 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 considerations. These are refinements of the traditional classical reverse mathematical setting, right? and therefore that's why I think of them all as kind of together. Um, and indeed, they are they are refinements. Um, so here's a nice example of of that, um, and this is Ramsey's theorem for different different colors. Right, so I mentioned that it really usually doesn't make any difference, and here's why. Um, if you give me uh, Ramsey's theorem, let's fix N, and you look at Ramsey's theorem for K colorings and Ramsey's theorem for two colorings, where K is at least two, right? So if K is one, Ramsey's theorem is trivial. Um, doesn't make any difference. If you just use one color, of course there's homogeneous sets. But let's look at Ramsey's theorem for K colorings and Ramsey's theorem for pairs. Uh, and Ramsey's theorem for two colorings, excuse me. So I'm... Um, Let's prove it in the specific example of K being three, right? So I claim that over RC not these are equivalent. Of course, Ramsey's theorem for three colorings implies Ramsey's theorem for two colorings, but let's prove the reverse, okay? So we are given a coloring of N tuples with three colors, right? And three is of course the colors are zero, one, or two. What we're going to do is define a coloring now of the same N tuples, but it will only use two colors. And here's how it'll work. Um, so you give me a, a, an n tuple x, and I'm going to look at what what color does c assign it. If it assigns it the, the color two, then uh, d will color it zero. And otherwise, that is, if if c gives it the color zero or one, this will give it the color one. Okay. So what we're doing, if you like, is is to is you know, we're squashing two colors together, right? We're saying if if you're using the color two, then fine. Otherwise, squash these together and treat them as one color. That's 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 what this D is doing. Okay, so this is this is an instance of Ramsey's theorem for two colorings, right? So we can apply RT22 and find an infinite homogeneous set for for this coloring D. Okay, so let's check, right? This this means that D is constant on the n tuples from a, from H. If D is equal to zero on every n tuple, that means C is equal to two on each of those n-tuples. So actually this is homogeneous for C as well. So that's great. In that case, we have a homogeneous set for the coloring we started with. It could, however, be that D of X is one for every tuple in H. Well, in that case, what does that mean? It means that C of X is either zero or one, right? Um, it's either zero or one on every n-tuple on H. Okay, so if I look at C restricted to the n tuples from H, I have another instance of RT22 now, right? It's a, it's a two coloring. On H, not on all of N, but on H, C is just a two coloring. It only takes two colors. So let's apply RT22 again. This time we find a homogeneous set uh, contained in H, and that's an infinite homogeneous set for C. Okay? So in this way, by squashing two colors and, and possibly applying Ramsey's theorem for pairs twice, we can get uh, we can get Ramsey's theorem for um, sorry Ramsey's theorem for two colorings twice. We can get Ramsey's theorem for three colorings, and of course that's fine. In a proof, we can do this is this is a proof in a formal system, right? So asking this question, hey, does is d of x equal to zero on it, or is d of x equal to one on it? That's fine in a proof. We can have case analysis in a proof, and if you have a premise in a in a proof, you can use that premise as many times as you want, right? So here we used it twice. We did it once here, and then if needed, we used it again. Okay, that's mathematical proofs can do that. Um, but this is conspicuous about this proof, and you might ask, well, is that necessary? Is there a proof maybe where you can do away with this case analysis, or maybe a proof where you can, you don't have to use Ramsey's theorem for two colorings twice. Maybe you can just use it once. And it turns out the answer is no, and we can precise, we can answer that 
quite precisely using these finer reducibilities, right? So provability over RCNA does not allow us to separate RTN3 and RTN2. Ramsey theorem for triples, Ramsey uh, for three colorings, Ramsey theorem for two colorings. But these finer reducibilities do, right? So um, this was kind of a series of, of results here, but um, uh, essentially this is what these are all saying. So this one here holds for uh, n bigger than or equal to one. Uh, this one also holds for n bigger than or equal to one. This one, I should say, this holds for n bigger than or equal to two. But essentially all it's, what it's saying is that if you have Ramsey's theorem for a larger number of colors, it's not reducible to Ramsey's theorem for a smaller number of colors, right? It's not reducible in the sense of Virac reducibility. Um, and it's not even, if, if n is bigger than one, uh, it's not even in the sense of computable reducibility. So somehow reverse mathematical probability of RCNA cannot distinguish RTN3 and RTN2. Virac reducibility and computable reducibility can. Um, and just a word maybe on the proof, the, the way one proves these kinds of things, right, is to, is, is these are proved by forcing constructions. So one builds a very specific kind of uh, instance of, of RTNK, Ramsey's theorem for a larger number of, of, of colors that defeats, uh, you know, does not have a homogeneous set computable from some homogeneous set of all instances of RTNJ, Ramsey's theorem for a smaller number of colors you know, computable from, from the, from, from the one we build or uniformly computable or what have you, right? Whatever the, whatever the reducibility is that we're looking at here. Okay. So, but the, the moral of it is that this is a, a this is a really a, a, a more fine tuned way of comparing principles. It's still answering somehow the same question as reverse mathematics, just with a different lens. Okay. All right, so now um, I think we have all the ingredients. So let, let's come back to the SRT22 versus co-prime, which is the title of this talk. And I've already, you know, we, we, we hinted at what it refers to in the, in the initial, in the, in the first part, right? Which is that it's, if one looks at a proof of Ramsey's theorem for pairs, you're looking at um, these, this kind of pre-processing and post-processing step. And that's a, that's a kind of general aspect of, of these proofs. Um, SRT22 and co are, are somehow references to these two parts, as, as we'll see. So um, we need a bit of background here. Um, so we're only looking at Ramsey's theorem for pairs now. So n is, n is two always, right? The, the exponent is always two. Um, so coloring like this is stable, uh, K coloring is stable, if there's some uh, I, some color, um, uh, sorry. Uh, oh, this is this this is poorly. I'm sorry. This is this is. Uh, there's a typo here. This, these two should be re re reversed. So for every x, sorry, if for every x um, in the natural numbers there is a color, so that c of x y is equal to that color for all sufficiently large y, right? So the way to think of it is that a coloring is stable if for each x the color CXY is independent of Y for large enough Y. It depends only on X, right? So maybe you're looking at zero, C color zero with one, zero with two, zero with three, zero with four, and so on. Maybe zero with one is red, zero with two is green, zero with one is, with, with three is red, then it's green, blue, green, red, red, green. But eventually it's red, 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 with all sufficiently large numbers, right? If that happens for all numbers X, then that's a stable coloring, okay? So the color eventually stabilizes. Uh, so I'm, I'm very sorry for this. Yes. Um, SRT2K is the restriction of Ramsey's theorem for pairs, RT2K, to stable coloring. So whereas Ramsey's theorem for, for pairs says every coloring has an infinite homogeneous set, SRT2K says every stable coloring has an infinite homogeneous set, right? So think of that as a, as a slightly uh, simpler problem because it has fewer instances, right? Ramsey's theorem for pairs has as an instance every coloring. This one has fewer instances. There's less to solve, right? Um, just the stable coloring. Not every coloring is stable, right? You could, you could certainly come up with a coloring that you know it alternates. It's red or blue depending on if it's if you're coloring with an odd or even number or something like this. Um, there's a related notion here, which is uh, a related principle called D2K. Um, 
let's say a set L is limit homogeneous for uh, a coloring C. If when I look at um, any X in L, um, then uh, let's say a stable coloring, right? Uh, a C. Then um, that eventual color that C has with, uh, with all sufficiently large numbers is the same for all the elements X and L, right? Let's, let's notice that in a homogeneous set, so let's say, let's say we have a stable coloring C, and let's take a homogeneous set H for this. So I have an infinite homogeneous set. If I look at the least element of this, right, it makes the color red, let's say, with every, every number in the homogeneous set. That means its eventual color has to be red, right? Because it's it's red with infinitely many things, and it has an eventual color. Well, then that eventual color has to be red if it's making red with infinitely many things. So here we're saying a set is, is, is limit homogeneous. It doesn't have to be homogeneous. It could be that, for example, 0 is an L, and 1 is an L, and 2 is an L, and 0 with 1 is red, and 0 with 2 is blue. That's fine. But the eventual color of each element in L should be the same. So every number in L eventually stabilizes to the same color. And D2K then is just like SRT2K. It says for every stable coloring C, except now it's not saying there's a homogeneous set. It's saying there's a limit homogeneous set. Okay. Um, now, if you have a limit homogeneous set, this is an exercise on, you know, when you're on the bus going home or whatever, you can think about it, but if you have a limit homogeneous set, you can always thin it out in a computable way to a homogeneous set. This is this is not difficult. Um, so a homogeneous set is always limit homogeneous set, not the other way around, but a limit homogeneous set you can thin out to a homogeneous one. Um, that is actually surprisingly difficult to prove in RCA not, uh, because you're using kind of a lot of induction in that proof, and RCA not has uh, I kind of glossed over this point, but RC not has uh, limited induction that's available to you. <clears throat> and um, uh, but nonetheless, it is this. It can be done, and that gives you an equivalence between SRT22 and D22 over RC not. So these are the same principle, uh, reverse mathematically. They are not, however, the same over some of these stronger, uh, uh, stronger, finer reducibilities. I should say. So SRT22 is strictly stronger under Virac reducibility and strictly stronger under strong computable reducibility. Uh, the two are equivalent over computable reducibility, but not under any of these stronger ones. So there's no uniform process, and there's and and you definitely need to have inst uh, access to the original instance to be able to uh, to get that equivalence. Um, but over RC not they are the same. Okay. Um, if you're, you know, if you, if you, if you, if you're kind of unencumbered by uh, interest in computability theory, if you're just, a, you know, looking at this purely combinatorially, then you would say, well, a stable coloring is just a, is just a coloring of singletons. I mean, why do you need to bother with pairs? If everything eventually has the same color, just think of it as, uh, as a coloring of singletons. Assign each number its eventual color, and there you go. And that's really what D22 is. If you look at a homogeneous set, a limit homogeneous set for D22, that's like looking at a homogeneous set for that associated coloring of singletons, where you color each number by just its eventual color. So D22 is solving an instance of RT12 combinatorially, um, but not comput computability theoretically, because that 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 coloring of singletons is more complicated than the coloring of of pairs. To figure out the eventual color is not computable, right? You have zero, you're looking at zero, and you know that eventually it colors the same with every number. But right now you're saying red, green, blue, green, red, blue. There's no computable way to figure out what that eventual color is, right? You need you need some computational strength to figure it out. But if you don't worry about that, just combinatorially, it is just like solving an instance of RT12. SRT22, therefore, is then solving an instance of RT12 plus thinning, plus some kind of thinning argument to get to get something which is homogeneous for the coloring of pairs. Okay, so that's what that's what this is. What should this remind you of? Well, what it, it should remind you of is that pre-processing step that we saw in the in the proof of the, you know, what we were calling the clique principle at the time, right? This Ramsey theorem for pairs that we saw initially. This is really the same, the same concept. Um, or rather, um, it's uh, sorry. It's the it's the 
it's it's solving that for that color D, that associated color D uh, that we had in that in that first process, in that first proof. Um, so once you have a nice coloring, a, a stable coloring, that's really what niceness means here. You're really kind of to the situation where you're solving an instance of RT12. That's the that's kind of the the situation we're at. But how do you get to that uh, to that step where you can you can look at that post processing? Well, first you need to pre-process it to get a nice coloring. And that corresponds to this principle called co. So um, co is a bit a bit uh, um, more difficult maybe to, to visualize, but here's what it is. Suppose you give me a, a family of subsets of the natural numbers, x0, x1. These can be finite or infinite subsets of, 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 of numbers. Then co says that there exists an infinite set y, which is what we call cohesive for this family. And what that means is that um, either y intersected with xi or y intersected with the complement of xi is finite. So y is up to finitely many numbers contained in x0 or up to finitely many numbers contained in the complement of x0. That's, this is what this is saying. And up to finitely many numbers that's contained in x1 or in the complement of x1. Now it might be contained in here, up to finitely many errors, and in here, up to finitely many errors, and then in the complement of the next one up to finite, right? it, does, it doesn't have to be the same side everywhere. But for each particular set, it's either almost contained in the set or almost contained in the complement. That's co. And the way to think of that combinatorially, again, if you sort of remove the, you know, the, the any kind of effectivity cons considerations, um, is that co is really like solving uh, countably many instances of Ramsey's theorem for singletons with two colors, so pigeonhole principle. Um, so you have infinitely many of them, uh, but you allow finitely many errors in each one of them. So you have an instance of RT12, the pigeonhole principle, and you're splitting omega into the natural numbers into two halves. You want a homogeneous set. Well, here's something that, you know, is not quite homogeneous, but except for finitely many numbers here, which may use red, green, blue, red, green, Everything else is red, right? Um, that's co. It comes really that's co. And that co is the pre-processing, right? In that in that original proof of the of the clique principle that we saw, co is exactly like um, that that process whereby we we thinned out, right? We thinned out that reservoir repeatedly, um, and we're able to define a coloring D that was now a coloring just on singletons. That was that pre-processing step. Co uh, is able to do that uh, as, as essentially a kind of combinatorial distillation of exactly that combinatorial step. Um, and then D22 is that post-processing step where we now solve a simpler coloring, a nicer coloring, coloring of singletons, and get a solution to the original coloring of pairs. Right? So what Co can do is it can take an arbitrary coloring of pairs and make it stable on some domain. It gives you an infinite domain, that's this cohesive set. And on that domain, the coloring becomes stable. At that point, we can apply D22 or really SRT22, which is like solving an instance of RT12, an easier problem, and get a homogeneous set for the original coloring. So CO and SRT22 or D22 are the two halves, those two parts that we saw before, right? That's the, that's the takeaway, okay? And indeed, uh, in this in this you know very famous important paper by Cholak, Jokic, and Slayman, where they really kind of took up a, a, a very deep analysis of Ramsey's theorem for pairs, they showed that Ramsey's theorem for pairs can be split into the stable Ramsey's theorem and and Co. And so you know that's not surprising once you kind of understand this connection between Co and the and the preprocessing and SRT22 and the postprocessing. The, the, the proof really is the same. Um, so it's not like just that, you know, this, this looks like the pre, pre and post processing because that was two parts and this is two parts. There's, there's actually a deep reason, you know, that this really does act like, like the net proof. And this really does act like the pre processing in that proof, right? So it, 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 it has the same, uh, the same, it's used in the same way. But this is a formalization of that fact and it, and it, and it does carry over in RCA not. Um, the longstanding problem, which, you know, is, is still open in some sense, despite having been solved several times, 
is is to understand precisely the relationship between co and SRT22, right? So you have a you have a fundamental combinatorial problem on the one hand, and you want to and you have a you have a split of it into two seemingly simpler problems. By understanding these simpler problems, you can understand this fundamental problem. That's that's the way SRT22 and co are used. That's the way we prove Ramsey's theorem, this clique principle, Ramsey's theorem for pairs at the beginning, using these two halves, right? Um, each one of them was simpler and, and uh, easier to get get our hands on. But um, one thing that, for example, isn't clear is whether this is in fact a proper split, right? So, so could it be that SRT22 implies co? Um, meaning that you know, if SRT22 implies co, then SRT22 implies RT22. There is no split, right? I mean, this post-processing step really is the same as solving Ramsey's theorem to begin with. Uh, there's no I mean, it may seem superficially like it's easier, but really they you are doing one and the same task. That was the that was the initial question coming out of this. And as I'll as I'll say in you know in the next few slides, this was solved and only to kind of realize that maybe the real question is somewhere somewhere else, right? Raising another question, which was again solved, and then again maybe this leads to another question, which may, maybe that's the real question, right? So in some sense, that's a that's a hallmark of a good problem, right? It's 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 saying that something very deep is going on, and and maybe it's not even that that clear what what the right question is, but it's generating new questions. Okay, so um, what was the solution to the original problem? So in uh, Initially, Chong, Slayman, and Yang. So the, I should I should just go back here. Sorry, I don't mean to make anyone dizzy. Um, this was this is a paper from around 2000 2001. So you know, sometime later in, in 2013, um, the 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 formal question was answered, uh, which was, does SRT22 imply co? Is this split proper? I, I should say it's it's very easy to show that co doesn't imply SRT22. So the pre-processing doesn't imply SRT22. But does the post-processing imply, imply the pre-processing? That was open. Does SRT22 imply co over RC not? Um, and Chong, Slayman, and Yang showed that the answer is no. Which, great. OK, so, so we have an answer. But interestingly, right? it's sort of a, a, a very unusual proof in terms of a non-implication of, of, um, of two combinatorial principles over RC not. Typically, the way one proves these separations for Combinatorial principles, right? Not induction principles or something, something more, um, you know, uh, more specialized. Um, is is that one builds a model of this, uh, and, and in fact, an omega model of this, a standard model with the standard numbers because it's those are easier to build. And in that model, this fails. Right? This is how we get a non-implication. Of course, that's a general fact about any kind of model theoretic separation. But but the model here is always a standard model, or almost always a standard model. Again, because there are many tools for building standard models, standard models are easier to work with, and so on. So we have this series of of, of results, you know, now telling us that these these two versions of Ramsey's theorem um, are different. Um, but um, once again, there's sort of uh, you know uh, a different question suggests itself. So. Um, there is another reducibility similar, if you like, to omniscient, uh, to computable reducibility and Virac reducibility, which is which is the following. Um, suppose we look at the problems P and Q, but now the following the following shape takes place. So every instance for every instance x of P, there is an instance x hat of Q, computable from X or not, but just it exists, such that for every solution y hat to this q problem instance x, uh, uh, one we can compute a solution y to the original. We have to have computability somewhere, right? We cannot just say for every instance there is an instance such that for every solution there is a solution. Then we lose the whole game. But we can we can remove this this top dependence. So this is uh, this is a notion that sometimes when we're separating principles shows up where we can say well not only is it is it the case that you know uh, P is not reducible to Q when we're looking at instances, computing instances, but in fact, for all instances. And so this is called strong, strong or not strong, depending on whether we join with, with, with the instance here or not, omniscient computable reducibility, right? So we're saying X sort of omnisciently knows an instance X hat of Q and, and so on, right? Um, 
so this is a this is a stronger notion. Uh, uh, I mean, uh, if we have a non-reduction, it's a stronger non-reduction, right? Because we're sort of we're killing off more instances of of the problem Q than just the instances computable from our given instance. Um, and the the first kind of interesting result here, maybe connecting um, connecting to Ramsey's theorem, is is this one that you know, if, 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 if we have a larger number of colors, K, than J, then Ramsey's theorem for K colorings is not even strongly omnisciently computably reducible to Ramsey's theorem for, for, for the smaller number, for J colorings, right? So there is a, um, uh, uh, there is no even sort of, it's not that if you give me a K coloring, there's some incredibly complicated, non-effective, way of getting a J coloring from which we could take a homogeneous set and compute a homogeneous set, we cannot do it in any way. There is simply no combinatorial way. So this is sometimes also called sort of combinatorial non-reduction. Um, this is a fairly complicated proof. So I had some, I was going to sketch it, but I guess I'll, I'll skip it. But I'll just say that, you know, once you get to this realm of moving outside computability, of course, you have to do all kinds of tricks because you're, you're quantifying over all possible colorings, which are Maybe computable, maybe not. You're really quantifying over the entire universe of functions. Um, so the proofs get get more esoteric, but it does suggest that maybe this is an int a different way of looking at the at these problems, where we look under this um, these these omniscient reducibilities, which are closer to saying there's no combinatorial collection connection as opposed to any kind of computability theoretic connection. Um, there is some connection here, which is that co is strongly omnisciently computably reducible to SRT22. So that's an interesting point of contrast. And I have a proof here, but again, in the interest of, of time now, I'll skip it. But I'll just say what it what it's saying. It's telling us that this, this pre-process is reducible to the to the to the to the post-process, assuming we kind of allow ourselves arbitrary complexity, right? So you give me an instance of Ramsey's theorem for pairs, I can define from it a very complicated stable coloring <clears throat> that can solve, that can sort of carry out both the pre and the post process. That's a fairly surprising result, but it tells us that things can get quite interesting here, right? Um, but the proof, so again, I won't, I won't say it, the proof kind of uses very much the homogeneity of this SRT22, um, as opposed to limit homogeneity, which we saw in the, on the D22 side. And so um, let me end there um, with this as my last slide. What if what happens if we look at D22? Remember, this is the principle which says for every stable coloring, there's a limit homogeneous set. So not necessarily a, a thinned out one, just every element in this limit homogeneous set has the same eventual color. Um, so it's known that under strong omniscient computable reducibility, this D22 principle is equivalent to RT12. It's just the pigeonhole principle. There's nothing, nothing else to it. Um, we can also see that Co is not strongly omnisciently reducible to, to this by, by that earlier result I mentioned. But if we remove the strong, then we get a, a fairly interesting question, which has almost no computability in it at all. It's almost entirely combinatorial. This is saying, is Co omnisciently computably reducible to D22, or in more natural parlance, maybe to a combinatorialist, is Co omnisciently reducible to RT12? So suppose you give me an instance of Co, so this is one of these families of sets, and you need to find something which is almost contained in or almost disjoint from each of the sets in it. Can you define a very complicated instance of RT12? Super non effective. It can be non arithmetic, it can, you know, live anywhere inside. Uh, any subset of the natural numbers will define such a, you know, is there anything like that? So that if you give me a homogeneous set for that, it computes one of those sets, one of those cohesive sets for Co. This is the open question that's sort of most interesting in some sense now, and is a form of the SRT22 versus Co problem that maybe most captures the relationship between this post and pre-process that, that we saw in the initial proof, right? I think an answer to this would have to use very, very different techniques from what we've been using so far and what we've been seeing, but um, could be quite informative if, if we saw it. Um, the last point I have here is that, you know, if, if, if Turing computations aren't to your liking, if you don't like computability, you could also just ask this question um, with respect to uh, just 
you know, purely on to, purely topological grounds. Um, Turing computations are effectively continuous transformations from between, you know, sets of binary strings and sets of binary strings, sequences and sequences. So there's you know, this Cantor space to Cantor space. So these are infinite sequences of zeros and ones. But if you remove this effectivity, then you just get continuous, right? So you could ask, does for every instance of co, right, which is one of these kinds of families, there exists an instance of RT12. So this is some, some two coloring of the natural numbers of arbitrary complexity, such that every, if you give me any infinite homogeneous set for this, right? There is there's a continuous mapping. So you have some continuous mapping fixed, fixed ahead of time. So there's a continuous mapping that takes that to a cohesive set. Right. I mean, that, the continuous mapping cannot cannot depend on C, otherwise it's trivial, right? But <clears throat> is there sort of a uniformly continuous mapping that takes solutions to this, to, to uh, homogeneous sets, uh, to, to cohesive sets for this? That is now just a kind of purely, you know, if you like, topological question, has no computability in it whatsoever. And in some sense is, 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 is the real crux of, of everything that's going on, right? So this would be the ultimate question to solve if this had a negative answer. Uh, but maybe this is the kind of true combinatorial distillation of the SRT22 versus co Trying to understand really the relationship between this post and pre-process of in the in the inductive proof of, of Ramsey's theorem that we saw. Um, so I'll stop right there. I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry about the uh, technical error, but thanks. Oh, for Thank you very much. So are there any, any questions or comments? Let's see, maybe I can minimize this. Yes, I do have one. Please. Um, yeah, um, so it, it, I, 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 it, can, you, can you please go back to the definition of strong, omniscient, omniscient yeah. reducibility? Um, is my understanding correct that this basically can be rephrased as saying that um, let's say for every x there exists an x hat such that um, the set of y solutions are like like the set of x solutions is mutually reducible to set of x hat solutions. Yes. yes right. That's right. And if you and if you and if you remove the strongly high, uh, strongly condition that it, it basically becomes instead of mutually let's say mutually relative to x. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's exactly okay, right. Okay, yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. So actually, yeah. All you know, if you, all of the all of the reductions we've been looking at can be phrased now in terms of two, two sets of Muchnik reductions. But yeah, here it's actually quite natural because there's only one, right? Yeah. So that's. that's a good point. Other questions. Maybe I, I'll ask a question. Can you move forward? Maybe one or two slides. I don't remember exactly. Uh, okay. So this results before, but uh, but actually this is uh, recent uh, the, the previous slide, I guess. Ah. Uh huh. Okay. Here. So could could we think that uh, you know after the fact, let's say after seeing that this actually is uh, some cause in some sense is computable from SRT two in this very very weak sense, let's say, this shows why it was so difficult to separate them for the other reducibilities somehow. Yes, I think that's right, because in, in a certain sense that that does explain it, because it, the natural way to do it is that you, you, you try to make the, right, you, you're, you're, typically you're doing it by forcing and you're doing some kind of very, you're building some kind of very generic instance and uh, of, of this, and ideally you want, you know, you want there to be sort of as less, uh, as little baggage to in the in the construction as possible, right? So you don't you don't want to necessarily have to bake in all the different things. Well, now I'm just looking at the computable things. I'm looking at all just the uniformly computable things from from that instance. You somehow would like it to be a simple combinatorial result where you can make maybe some kind of cardinality argument or something like this that allows you to conclude that for everything like this, there isn't uh, there isn't a solution to this one that it computes. But that would exactly show, as you say, that that this doesn't hold, which which it does, right? So that's 
why these proofs had to become kind of much more specialized over time and have that connection much more explicit uh, of the particular kind that we are doing. Yeah. I think that is a good explanation. Other questions or comments? Yeah, sorry, just a small one. As a follow up to my previous um, question, can you go to the result on the, yeah, exactly. The, 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 the previous one? Ah, okay. That one, yes. Yes. Um, the non strong omniscient, com oh, it's strong. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, it's a strong. Oh, you, yeah. you already, you already solved my, you already answered my question. Okay. <laughs> yeah, for, without strong, right? For RT1, it's, it's always trivial to get solutions. Right, right. That that was my, but I didn't yeah, yeah, remember yeah. that what was wrong there. So that's it. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks. Yeah. Other questions? So I, I have a question. And do you hear me? Yes, I do. Hi. Okay. So regarding the Ramsey theorem, like the two coloring of of pairs, like the R two R T two two. Yes. You know, if it's been studied, it's possible relations with combinatorial properties that have to do more with weakly compact cardinals. Oh, I, I, I say this because uh, for a cardinal to be weakly compact, this is equivalent to having a two coloring of its pairs. And maybe there are combinatorial properties of omega that can be used like compact and compactness things or something. I don't know. Yeah, I know yeah. much less about this, but <clears throat> yes. So. There are, I think, some some things that people have looked at, and even in in the context of reverse mathematics. So people have looked at kind of miniaturized version of various kind of cardinality properties, and they have looked at the you know, I mean, things become a little bit. It, it's a bit dubious to say whether it's actually has a strong connection or not to the to the original motivation, since you know you're 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 putting it all into this countable setting. But people have then looked at uh, the connections with Ramsey's theorem for pairs. So there is there is some stuff that people have looked at. But yeah, something more, you know, looking at that uh, sort of the, the core combinatorial ideas used in set theory when studying weakly compact cardinals and other kinds of cardinals indeed could be could be quite useful here. And in general, there is a kind of, um, there is a sort of tradition of computability theorists rediscovering things that set theorists already knew a long time ago and then applying it in a countable setting to to study these problems. And so... Maybe you know. Maybe it might be useful to, for more of us to look at some set theory literature where people have been looking at this for a long time and uh, and seeing if some of those combinatorial tools could could come out uh, could be used here. Um, but they're you know. But but they are being. I mean, I'm being a little facetious, right? But these things are being done. I mean, for example, in the in the in the Monan and Pate result here, right? One thing that they really kind of developed was was a was a notion of partition regularity, which is very plays a very key role in this proof. And, mm -hmm. you know, this has shown up a lot in, in set theory and combinatorics, of course, in very central ways. And so there are there are lots of deep connections along the lines you're, you're suggesting. Uh, and probably, you know, there's room for, for a lot more. But yeah, so I, I think overall, something is known and probably much more is, 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 is should still be looked at. Okay, thank you. Thanks, that's a good question. Other questions? Uh... If not, I, could, I think we can uh, thank Damir again for his uh, you. 